Sebastian looking at the camera, Rick looking at the camera, Joe that way into the distance, and yeah, perfect. Four men <laughs> and one woman, living as 19th century Klondike gold miners, are traveling to the heart of Canada's Yukon Territory, where they hope to strike it rich. Nuggets as big as peacock eggs, the newspapers of the day wrote. Gold everywhere for the taking. It is their 20th day in the year 1897. So far, life on the Gold Rush Trail has been harder than they ever could have imagined. Andrea Bellon, the granddaughter of a Klondike can-can girl, found that period-appropriate boots cause period-appropriate blisters. Blister, blister. Oh. And folk singer Joe Bishop was careless with his knife. I don't know if the the results were sudden and bloody. Oh, I might just hold. Yeah, I can see the tendon. Dave Delnia, a mountain climber from a town called Hope, was out of action after only three days on the trail. Just grin and bear it, I guess. Like, what else can you do? And Rick Unruh, who has such a passion for gold that he uses scuba gear to mine underwater, also pulled up lame. <laughs> it's spasming up on me, eh? Yeah, if I have to, I'll just cut it so it stops spasming so much. But none of their injuries was as painful as that of 19-year-old Quebecer Sebastian Racine. While helping carry the team's boat, he hurt the part of his anatomy men across history have sought to protect. These many delays have put them behind schedule and they now face the very real possibility of running out of food. We're on short supply of everything to last for three months. Is that all the vegetables we have in the little... That little jar is all the vegetables we have. This is potatoes. <laughs> this is all the potatoes. Oh, so I counted it all the first day. Do we eat the, I told you guys. Barley. A recent quarrel over Andrea's decision to ration the food has prompted them to take an inventory. The news is not good. How does this look, Sebastian? Uh, not that much food for three months. Yeah. yeah. So I think uh, I'm going to be skinny at the end of the trip. <laughs> I'm spilling some of the sugar. This precious quantity. This is like gold. How important is it that we do this? It's extremely important because everybody feels like I'm being cheap and I know they're working hard and I know they need fuel but ration they're they're passionate about their food and I'm rationate about their food I like to eat just as much as the rest of them we're walking for what 13 hours and we get eight pieces of dried fruit and a little chunk of bannock yeah and a piece, and of, a piece of jerky. That's why you're motivated to go to Dawson and get the gold so you can go to Klondike Kate's and have a steak. We're going to be crashing on the trail. Part of this whole thing of going and looking for gold is the optimism things are going to work out. <laughs> what all started it was I took away the sugar. I just took it away. I said, no, you guys can't have any more sugar. You're just picking up. Well, we need the sugar. We need the energy. And it's, well, you're going to need the sugar and the energy because the trail is only going to get harder from here. That's the easy part back there, what we just did. The team is traveling from Dyee, Alaska to Dawson City, Yukon. After weeks of work, they've reached Canyon City, a historic rest point they will soon begin the dangerous climb into the mountains and across the Chilkoot Pass. The final mile, known as the Golden Staircase, was feared by the Gold Rush Stampeders. Moving day. The team is heading up the trail to a place called Sheep Camp. It's a journey of just three miles but it will take all day. At the time of the gold rush, few stampeders had been north. Most came from cities 
and were unprepared for the hardships they would face. As tens of thousands of would-be miners struggled up this trail, exhausted and hungry, towns like Sheep Camp sprung up. Esther Lyons was one of the many who stayed here. Here, under the summit of the Chilkoot, there are hotels and restaurants. Mr. Wilson arranged for supper, and flapjacks were ordered. They resembled stove lids, but were eaten with the relish of a dinner at Delmonico's. Sheep camp is gone now. But the site is still used as a rest point before the climb to the summit. It's where the men of the team and their packers have stopped. Andrea has been left far behind. In 1897, this would not have happened, but the men find her tough and demanding. They keep to themselves. Two hours later, she arrives, exhausted. The men are also tired. They're moving the 3,000 pounds of gear load by load, which means multiple trips. Today, they've climbed this section of the trail three times. Andrea has done it once. If I want to get my tent set up, I got to set it up and get the manly men to help me. There are no volunteers. Eventually, Ron Chambers and the Klingit Packers lend a hand. Harper's Magazine sent a reporter to cover the army of stampeders trying to cross this pass. His name was Tappan Adney. Some say not one in ten will make it. They come from desks and offices, never having done hard work. What are the chances of getting over, everyone asks? The answer? That depends on what you are. Day 22, a time for their own answers. They have decided to try the tough climb to the Chilkoot summit. Might be a little bit slippery, might be a little bit foggy up there, but we're gonna go anyhow and just get an idea what the trail's like on the way up there, so. Okay. Give us an idea of how long it'll take us to make a trip, and then we can kind of get a little bit organized on how we wanna proceed. In the nearby tent, a different decision is made. Packers Ron Atlan and Ralph James feel the trail is too wet, the climb too dangerous. They refuse to go. On this side of the pass, the rain falls almost constantly. Trail conditions are poor. A century ago, the Klingit often refused to work if they felt unsafe. Ralph and Ron are making the sort of choice their great-grandfathers might have made and head back down the trail for supplies. Where have the Packers gone? They didn't want to go up to the summit just because it's foggy, which it could be foggy for, you know, weeks on end. We talked about it last night that everyone was going to the summit today, and uh, that was the plan. And we had no idea that their plans had changed until they started walking out of camp. So, so why don't you guys just fire them? Because, because they're still carrying some, and that's better than nothing. What would the Stampeders have done? Well, I suspect we'd have just let them go and found some new Packers that 
we're a little more compliant. But uh, I haven't seen any fresh ones going by, so we're just kind of stuck with what we got. <laughs> the Packers have actually, they've notched themselves up in my book quite a lot now because they're, they're actually looking after me better than the white men folk are. You know, they worry about me. They make sure I have all my firewood. They make sure I have everything I need so that I can do my job. All right. Okay, well, who knows the way? Start walking. I don't know, but the trail goes this way. Okay. During the gold rush, this vast emptiness echoed with the sounds of a living serpent of men. Laughter and curses, rumor and gossip. All anyone knew for sure was that the trail led north, over the mountains, into the future, where the fields of gold lay waiting. About 100,000 stampeders began the epic journey to Dawson City. Most came over the White Pass or Chilkoot routes. The White Pass, known as Dead Horse Pass, was safer but longer. The Chilkoot, short and dangerous, especially the final climb. One and a half miles of boulders and loose rock known as the Golden Staircase. A century ago, Tappan Adney's journey brought him to the foot of the Chilkoot. The valley rises rapidly and the trail is very bad, but the mountain is alive. At its base is a great mass of rock. This is the Scales, one of the most wretched places on Earth. The Scales was the last stopping point before the Stampeders tried for the summit. It's where the loads were reweighed, and the Klingit often renegotiated their fees. Apparently here in this area, Packers would just drop, drop the gear and quit and say, we're not going any further unless you pay us more money. There would have been uh, a lot of uh, anxiety around this area at that time. It's kind of strange to be here and look at the picture and think that they was they were here like exactly at the same time. There was probably somebody sitting here and talking about about gold and stuff like that. Probably a lot of people got here and said it's not worth it. And turned around and went home. It'll be much easier traveling after this. So this is the historic point. This is a piece of history right up there. The major point of the whole trip. Um, is yeah, right in front of us. Now this morning, you guys didn't want to go onto the pass. Why was that and what were you worried about? Well, we weren't worried too much about anything. It's just that the, it was blowing and then it was starting to rain down here, so it would be worse up at the pass. We knew it would be cold and wet and so we figured we'd go down there for the day and see if by by overnight it's going to clear up. It's always dangerous up, up this high country like this. But the weather changes so so fast and so easy. And if you miscalculate a step or something, it could easily sprain your ankle or break your ankle or break your leg. And then uh, that'll put us all in a bind because then we got to move you to a safe place where they can come and pick you up. If the Stampeders asked the Packers to do something they didn't want, what would they say? Yeah, I most likely they'd say no, they wouldn't do that. There were so many people going through here at the time, and if, then if they didn't get along good with the guy they were working with, well, then they just went to somebody else. Back then, they were 
they were a feared people. They, they were known as the warring tribe from the north. And that sense of pride and everything is still there. Yeah, even though that uh, we've been intermingling with the white race for a long time now. This is the ascent that Ron and Ralph refused to make, the Golden Staircase. In 1897, it was the gateway to a fabled land of riches. A century later, the romance is gone, but the danger remains. stop us now that was that was the, the the real challenge and i think we come through with flying colors Got okay sebastian oh yeah <laughs> yeah yeah how was it uh, it was pretty hard but that's the <laughs> the gift at the end <laughs> that feels great finally to get here yeah yeah it was awesome yeah it was great uh it was completely unexpected it was just yeah it was really really neat First climb to the summit was a success. Now it's time to clear the air with the packers. Most of the gear remains in the valley. They need the packers' help to get it over the pass. There is some good news. A new packer has arrived to help speed things up. So I guess we're setting up the strategy how we're going to make the move from here to the next camp with our with our tents, our sleeping gear, and our kitchen <coughs> gear. We got all our camp gear packed, our bed roll ready, just gotta take the tent down. Then I got about a 50 pound bed roll, just, just my bed, you know. <laughs> right, okay. If you're only one load shy or something, one of us could carry it for you. It's a difficult conversation, and Joe picks his words carefully, but his message is simple. Everyone must move faster. And you guys make more money this longer it takes. Well, that's we're not enough. really looking at that. No, but that's, thing. if we're looking at agendas, true, what's yeah, driving I mean, us right, to make yeah. money is the opposite of what's driving you guys to make money, yeah. right? If we look at agendas. Yeah. When we came into Finnegan's before, it was just the awkward stuff that was left. Historically, we're kind of thinking to ourselves, you know, well, wouldn't this be the re reverse? Wouldn't the Packers be doing the harder stuff? The Packers, historically, were independent. Uh, entrepreneurs is what they were and they said if that's 50 pounds and it's contained like that and that's 50 pounds and it's like that and gonna bump in the trees which 50 pounds are you gonna take yeah. see that's what they would have done I have no doubt about it after the meeting little has changed 
Like their great-grandfathers before them, the Packers have held their ground. They will carry what they choose. The Stampeders will carry the rest. I think everybody's working hard. At the same time, you want to find a way of doing it, of saying things to encourage people to really just push as much as they can push. So, um, And the yeah. sensibilities of today are different than they were 105 years ago. Oh, totally. Just as far as you kind of have to watch or, yeah, just be aware of the words coming out of your mouth. Well, they were a pretty powerful group of people in their own right already. So I can see that there must have been some heavy-duty rows going on between some of the miners and the Tlingit. The boat has become the bane of their existence. Weighing over 200 pounds, it requires most of their energy to move. And when they reach the lakes, no one knows if it will float. Worst of all, they still have to haul it up the golden staircase. Rick Unruh is the team Iron Man. He says he'll get the boat to water if he has to carry it himself. It's awkward as hell, but uh, it's heavy, eh? Everybody said, you know, like, we know you can do this. My biggest fear would be is if something happened and I, and I let those people down. You know, if there's one thing that, that I w want out of life, you know, would be to, for my, my family, you know, to be proud of me and for my, my friends to respect me. You know, that's, that's, that's all I really want. I don't, you know, I don't need lots of money or fame or fortune or anything. I mean, that's, that's really, those are the things that really matter to me. Between two guys, it's pretty bulky, so. But we're getting, we're getting used to it. It feels like it's getting a little bit lighter every time. Every mile we go, it gets a little bit lighter. Well, wait till we get to the pass. Yeah, then we'll yeah, then. <laughs> then we'll know where the bear was in the buckwheat. <laughs> With the men on the trail, Andrea is alone at camp. But sometimes, she's not so sure about that. There's a lot of voices in the air around here. You know, you, if I always think someone's out there or someone's calling me and then I look around and there's nobody here. It's like there's, there's people here in the bush. It's, I guess it's ghosts, but I don't... Some of them think they just roll their eyes ahead of me when I say the place is haunted, but I feel it. Once they're gone, I put away all their stuff into their tent. I move all the furniture out of the way so that I can work around the stove. The wood here is really dense. I go for the dead wood that lies on the ground because it's partially rotten and it's easier to break. It's hard to keep clean. Everything, you think you're clean, but you're not. <laughs> I have on my cleanest shirt. If I was, look how dirty my apron is. If I wasn't wearing that, I would be absolutely filthy. What about the Stampeders? What do they do about sweat and dirt and all the things that are in their clothes from day on the trail? I really think that yeah. the Stampeders just wore their clothes until they rotted off their bodies and didn't worry about that because they just want to get over the hill well, and get the gold. Good job, well done. I knew you guys could do it. <laughs> we didn't bring you it is the end of their 25th day on the trail, and most of the gear is at sheep camp. Getting it this far has been hard. Getting it over the pass will be worse. Early July, the Alaskan sun has finally appeared, drying their clothes 
and warming their spirits. What do you think the Stampeders would have talked about on the trail? I think food would have been one of the topics. Gold, of course, would have probably been the buzzword. Um, so that would have been the major topic. Um, and then there would have been talk about, um, they had a lot of issues to deal with going up those, that golden staircase about um, the mounted police at the top. They would have been talking about the Packers and how much they were charging. What do you think they would have been talking about? It was probably talking about girls. I think about girls. Yeah, about the girls that are in town, and because I think there was not that much girl around here, so I think it was probably a big conversation topic. Back at camp, I don't think there was any conversation because the women are alone. I'm alone all day. I'm going to talk to myself, and I'm going to complain to myself about the blasted men eating my rations of bannock and not even saying thank you. Thank you, Andrea. Mm-hmm. Thank you. The Gold Rush Stampeders were often photographed for the newspapers of the day. Dave Delnia has been given a rare period camera to document his journey. The other day, Joe and I were walking together and uh, took a rest at one of the bridges that goes across the river and took our boots off to let our feet kind of dry out a little bit so we don't get blisters as bad. So we had our, our boots off and we're just sort of laying on the bridge with our feet dangling over the river and I was saying that uh, I feel like, like we're Tom Sawyer and Huck Finn, like just little boys on this adventure. It's a beautiful, beautiful area. I think every day I'm, I have a moment where I kind of stand in awe at the, just the beauty of the area that I'm in. So that's pretty cool. Tap and Adney also thought the area was cool, but he put it his own way. The trail opens out and a heavenly view is presented to the eye. Across the valley to the westward, the blue hills, it is magnificent. Day 30, the team has moved high into the mountains. The heat of the blazing sun, a welcome change from the dampness at sheep camp in the rainforest below. As they move through the alpine meadows, the trail becomes rockier, the risk of injury very real. Well, somebody probably buried right here. I suspect this is an early grave marker, you know, uh, some unfortunate soul pursuing his dreams and this is as far as he got you know for who knows maybe his friends family don't even know you know where he died or who knows sometimes word wouldn't get out so just a lost soul yeah that's a risky run to follow your dreams <laughs> No one knows how many died following their Klondike dreams. Stories from the time say three or four men a day, dead from exhaustion, infection, or avalanche. Tappan Adney. A dead man was brought out today. He'd overdone himself. I heard of a big snow slide where two or three hundred lives were lost, but later found out it was only 52. You okay, Joe, with that sled? Yeah, it's a bit awkward and heavy, but because we can't get uh, two trips in a day, we're trying to get the loads heavier. <laughs> okay, Sebastian, can you put like, both hands on your knee? Perfect. All right, and everybody hold still, please. Photography is the art of seeing what others do not. And the creative eye is timeless.
With the Packers and his teammates carefully positioned, Dave Delnia opens a window in time. Great, and now you're all looking as though you're walking, so just stand just like that. Today becomes yesterday in the blink of a camera's eye. the trail going up now? Well, right now, because of the, the time of the day, the snow is really slippery and there's a lot of breakthrough points, so you have to be careful. You could easily drop through and uh, twist or injure your leg quite severely. Plus, there's a lot of rocks right under the snow, so there's always a possibility of a rock injury, too. And once we get on that slope, it's it could be really slippery. If you fall, you might go away before you're able to stop yourself. Up until this point, this is what everybody was striving for, to get over the top. You know, the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. At sheep camp, the mists soak to the bone. Most days, they awaken damp and hungry. Andrea cooks what she can, but rations are short. What does the diet ahead look? Sparse. <laughs> it's beans in the morning and peas in the afternoon. Bannock every other time, and we're gonna run out of butter soon. <laughs> Today, they have decided to move the heavy midsection of the boat up the golden staircase. They need a good breakfast, but it's more of the same. Bannock and Bannock. No, we've all been losing weight, and what we've noticed in the, the last week is uh, from Dai to here, we've been getting stronger and stronger, and now uh, with the diet we're on, our stamina, we're losing energy and stamina, so we're, we've peaked physically, and now we're starting to get a uh, weaker. There's just a point of the day that it's go like zoom down and, and it's it's something that happened like I noticed in like three minutes you're walking and you start to feel a little bit like and in three minutes you feel like fall asleep right on the trail. The weather near the summit is unpredictable. Although it's midsummer the temperature is just above freezing and the ice wind blows heavy from the pass. This is their 30th day as a team of Gold Rush Stampeders, and it will be their most difficult. We've come prepared. We've, you know, taken all the necessary <coughs> precautions that we can possibly think of after kind of scouting it out yesterday. It'll be a struggle for sure. I think it'll be, yeah, it'll be a really tough, tough vlog, but we'll make it. It's fast, too. Uh, my opinion on the boat is I don't agree to carry the boat today. Why do it then? because we, we, we need to be together and we need to be four to do that. Okay. A real risk up there is hypothermia because we've got all the elements that are, are there to, to <coughs> cause it. In 1897, a chain link of men struggled up this slope under their heavy loads. Rest points made the journey safer but the climb was seen as the first real test of whether a man had what it took to be a Klondiker. Tappan Adney. The trail is very steep. One must climb on hands and knees from boulder to boulder. The mountain is alive with a moving train of human beings. Never did a man look so small.
first time in 105 years a boat has come over this mountain. Well, I'm sure it is. It's probably the, the last time for 105 years. Yeah, you must feel pretty proud of this. Yeah, absolutely. This is a, a day I'll remember for a long time. Dave, I remember at the beginning you said to me one of the reasons you wanted to do this was yeah. because you wanted to do something extraordinary. That's right. I think today qualifies. I think it qualifies as well. It's a great feeling. Quite a, uh, yeah, this will be a, one of those days that, that I remember about the trip, like, forever and ever. So, it's pretty cool. <laughs> the day has been hard won. The victory well earned. However, the pride of the moment is not just theirs. From the mist, a phantom image. 53-year-old Klingit packer Ralph James also carries his load to the summit. Below, at sheep camp, Andrea knows what's expected of her. Everybody's starving. Everybody needs to be fed right away. Dinner is mashed potatoes and corned beef, just like they had last night. It's a night for celebration. See what else I brought? The pork! Yeah! Getting their boat up the golden staircase was a triumph for this team of Stampeders. But it was just one of many trips they face as they fight their way towards the gold fields, load by load by load. And the real struggles are still to come. Can they live with the constant ache of hunger? And what choices will they make if the food runs out? I'm so skinned, I, that scares me. Like, I'm able to see my... I'm able to see my... My... Oh, you will not see it, but... I'm able to see my bones everywhere, so I don't know what it's gonna be, what it's gonna be in... in two months, in two months, and yeah, that definitely scare me. Day 34, a day Andrea has been dreading. She is moving their kitchen to a trapper's cabin 24 miles away. It is a marathon journey, which will take her over the pass for the first time. But like these straps, are they attached to these straps? No. So we could take this off and just carry it if we have to. The only thing I'm worried about really is this thing squirting out the bottom and... She hasn't really been packing at all, so she's not kind of prepared for this. Um, so every time she has to pack, it's, and we have no idea her strength or her weaknesses until she's there. So And where's the hard part for her? What are you worried about? The golden stairs will be the hardest part. It's the steepest part, it's loose rock, and your pack is really important because if it's too top heavy and you stand up, you'll flip right over backwards, so. And if she falls, what will happen? Then one of us has to cook. <laughs> I'm nervous. <laughs> the Packers' deal with the Stampeders is over, and they will soon be returning home. Ralph James is especially proud of his efforts. His great-grandfather was Skookum Jim. On August 16th, 1896, Jim saw gold as thick as cheese in a sandwich at Rabbit Creek, a find which started the Klondike Gold Rush. It does something for me when they ask me to do this, because it's, uh, well, he did it, and, and I'm trying to recreate what he did. I believe he's watching me, and... Yeah. And is he, is he laughing? Uh, he's probably killing himself laughing. He was a joker, they say, you know, and he's probably killing himself laughing, you know. 
just watching me sweat all the way up the trail, you know? Mm -hmm. Your thoughts on uh, the whole stampede and the Klondike and the people who did this? It took a lot of nerve for them to go over there, so many people figuring all, they're all going to get rich. Many of them didn't. A lot of hardships along the way. Even now in this modern time that we're doing it is, uh, it is pretty hard. You know, there's winners and losers all the way along, but the thing that I, bothers me here is that uh, the biggest losers of all were the Native people who were here. They, uh, you don't see anybody around. There's no reference to them. There's no sign of their homes. Uh, my grandmother was born in this area, and uh, there's no sign or reference to her or her people, you know, and I find that uh, pretty sad. How's your pack feeling? A lot lighter. And uh, I guess it'll get heavier on the other side. The men have already left for the other side. Andrea must find her own way across what a poet once called the Long Trail of Tears. Next time on Klondike, the quest for gold. Andrea's long journey over the Chilkoot continues. If I was a real stampeder, I would sleep anywhere that I needed to. And right now, that's all I can think about. The men reach Lake Lindemann and find the boat they have carried so far leaks. This will be the least of their problems as they run out of food. <laughs> There you go. Join us next time on Klondike, the quest for gold. Why does it look like a rat? Whoa, I think it's a piece of cork. Duh. <laughs>